My name's Alex Lubbock. I head up digital construction within the Infrastructure and Project Authority. Now I've got much louder. Um, uh, what is the Infrastructure and Projects Authority? We are a directorate of the Cabinet Office. So in real world terms, I essentially work in the group function of government. All right, so I work uh, across central government departments supporting their adoption of building information modeling. But more latterly, I also lead on uh, manufacturing and technology more broadly. So around our offsite agenda, uh, as well as anything else that kind of comes my way. Um, I, I got very uh, uh, craftily sort of bumped and changed around for that session, but it was really good to actually sit through uh, the, the panel. No, 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 no problem. Um, uh, and it was just really interesting seeing some of the questions, and hopefully uh, my presentation will be fairly complementary uh, to that discussion. So, what's the challenge? We have a £600 billion forward pipeline projected as a UK government over the next decade. What that means is we have a significant amount of investment that is either, either sort of public or private-led investment uh, underpinned by government in terms of critical national infrastructure and infrastructure across the country, whether that is housing, social infrastructure, or economic infrastructure. This is broadly how that is split down. So you'll see it, uh, most of the people in the room will hopefully operate supporting public sector in some way, shape, or form, whether that's through a, uh, the wider public sector in terms of local authorities, NHS trusts, etc., or whether that is direct with central government through uh, the likes of Department for Education, Ministry of Justice, uh, or some of the more sort of transport-led initiatives. Now, since 2011, the world has changed. So I don't think I stand here today, and I don't think the people in the room stand here today had we not had a UK government BIM mandate. We have come a long way in the last eight years through a significant amount of vision by those involved at that point in time, and we should be thankful for some of that vision. In terms of setting out that longer term strategy around BIM level two as a mandate from 2016, without really having any standards. We didn't know how that was going to kind of play out particularly. But to have that level of vision and set that agenda and set that direction has had a significant market shift in terms of the technology providers that support this market. Uh, there is a number of BIM and digital consultants that sit in the room, so your businesses are kind of effectively thriving on that outcome. We also have a summit here today, so the, the, those that organise summits, some looking at, looking at uh, uh, Digital Construction Week in the middle going, that doesn't exist if, if, if that hasn't happened. We're world leading in terms of thinking about these kind of things from a government perspective. We set that agenda, but how do we deliver it with industry and with academia? I think that was the most powerful kind of thing that I can kind of talk about in terms of the journey to date is the relationship that government has welcomed in industry and academia to support this agenda, to develop the standards, to build through a knowledge base that is now being exported around the globe. So in terms of that conversion to ISO, yeah, don't ask me about the implications. I'm not the person to ask. But actually, it shows UK standards, UK thinking, now being converted to a world stage. This creates market opportunities to everyone in the audience to go and operate under a consistent banner and approach in global markets with any luck. That's the power of having that kind of vision and that kind of collaboration. UK BIM pipeline, over 160 billion. I'll be honest, I kept getting FOI requests saying, how much are we doing, how much are we doing? So I actually went away and tried to find out. So of our projected £600 billion pipeline, of which a significant amount of that is not mandated, actually the vast majority of it is not, I managed to identify that we have at least £160 billion worth of four projects in there that are, have a BIM requirement. That should give you the confidence to continue in on this journey. So whilst in the trenches of project delivery today, we're not always getting this right as a client, we are maturing, 
and we are asking for more and more. This is growing exponentially off the scale. But what does that mean again internationally? With that kind of market leading advantage in the UK that we've developed, people come to see us. We go to see them. So the graphic on the other side looks at the Growth Prosperity Fund. This is a foreign office uh, initiative looking at a number of different sectors and how we kind of support in-country development of uh, skills and capabilities. But also the secondary aspect of that is that there is potentially a market opportunity for service providers to go in-country. So everyone will be aware of the Centre for Digital Built Britain. Uh, they do a number of things internationally supporting government to government to think about what their strategy for implementation of BIM is. And actually, that starts to create opportunities and secondary opportunities for delivering projects in those countries. And we are helping many countries that sit on that map across the globe today. But inevitably, not everything has gone smoothly. It's taken us eight years to get to where we are. So the graphic that um, <clears throat> was on the previous screen around the early majority, I guess what I'm seeing and what I'm saying from that pipeline projection is, actually, I think we're further along the journey, but I'm looking probably at your next projects in the next two or three years rather than what you're actually delivering today. But in terms of the lessons learned, BIM as a word, we still have to explain what this is to people. That's a problem. And I think the maturity of the UK is that we've moved across to starting talking about digital. This is a digital construction summit, not a BIM summit. Digital is synonymous with productivity. We don't question digital because it's all around us. It's in our lives, it's the way we do things. I've got a phone in my pocket, it's digital. I use Spotify, I use Facebook, I use Google, I use whatever those things are. These are digital things. It's kind of innate that we are doing digital things. Even from a television perspective, in 2009 to about 12, we had the digital switchover. We wouldn't do it if it wasn't better, obviously. So actually, BIM has become a bit of a, a bugbear, I guess, in terms of UK, but where it does give us opportunities in that brand globally. So people adopt that brand. So you go on a LinkedIn, you look up BIM, you'll get hundreds of thousands of people, you will get well over a thousand groups looking at every single different part of project delivery just around BIM. So the net effect of again, having that vision, starting this journey and being where we are today is that yeah, we're not, we're not done with it, but actually we're a significant way along the track. But as a lesson learned, perhaps we'd have maybe not had it called building information modeling. Benefits. We had a load on benefits in the last session. Who has seen the BIM Level 2 Benefits Measurement Methodology, methodology Report developed by PwC in conjunction with IPA, Cross Government and the Centre for Digital Built Britain? Okay, well, there's something for people to go and have a look at later and some bedtime reading there. What it is, is a good econo economic view on how to measure the benefits across the project life cycle of project delivery. What it isn't, is in a usable digital format that makes it nice and easy to complete. <laughs> Problem. So a really great piece of work. And reflecting on the journey we're going on around modern methods of construction, manufacturing for construction, one of the key lessons learned we're trying to bring to the party there is actually we need a benefits measurement methodology which has the rigor of something like that but is actually usable by people that are essentially novices to the industry. And the other bit. Yeah, I've been out there as an industry person sitting in billions of pounds worth of tender meetings with clients pretending that I'm going to be the one servicing them on that contract. I've done that. I guess that's some of the value that hopefully I bring to the cross department, uh, working groups, etc. is that I know the rubbish that we've had to deal with on the other side and actually simp simplifying our message and being more consistent about that message is another output of what we're trying to achieve through our manufacturing agenda. 
a further level of sort of standardization and consistency, helping hopefully supply chains to align their systems, their approaches, their responses, so we actually move forward uh, quicker together. But the challenge for us, and I believe for industry, is to do this by default. You know, we've had some, some very sophisticated clients here, not all the way along their journey, but a significant way along the, work, the journey on understanding what they want as asset owners, how they want to deploy this, how they want to exploit that journey. Why are we not able to respond by default as a supply chain? Why are we still having that discussion going, yeah, but you could have this, or we could have that? Actually, give, give the customer what they're asking for, and we'll work on making sure that the customer's asking the right question, okay? This should not be a cost extra. This should, should be a by default response. And if they start asking for the world beyond that standard response, then you know, that is a pay for service. But let's make that clear. Let's be clear about what we are offering and how we're going to engage. In the broader context, we had a little reference to you know, 10, 15 years down the, t down the line. How do I get people to change the bulkhead light and understand that? Who are those people? We have a 600 billion pound forward pipeline projected to deliver. If we deliver that in the same way traditionally as we always have done, we may or may not succeed in delivering that pipeline. If we start to think differently, start taking the opportunity of exploiting the digital technologies, the data and the information available to us, we can start to develop the skills agenda alongside it. Too many sort of discrete projects doing fantastic things in their own right that aren't necessarily scalable and applicable to others. We've got to sort our own house out and we're trying to do that. And we're engaging through the things like the Construction Innovation Hub and the Transforming Construction Program as a part of the industrial strategy to help on that journey. There are very clear messages from the Construction Leadership Council, which represent you through the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and from central government in terms of what we are trying to approach. We are looking at digital, manufacturing, whole life performance, skills, and procurement, because we know that these are enablers to delivering better value for money. But we also need to think about this, and this I don't see often enough in the sector. We have to stop publicizing hard hat, high viz, pardon the expression, hairy ass, and start thinking about what is the brand of the industry we want to project? And again, it's for this group to start to articulate that. Some of the technologies and some of the approaches that are available to us today give us a huge opportunity to change the diversity of the sector. But we're not telling that story. And we need to think about what is that joined up vision for the sector that we want to be and how do we want to kind of go and get there? So what are our latest policy steps on the journey? So in 2017, we had a budget announcement, five departments committing to a presumption in favor of off-site government to use its buying power to effect essentially a market shift in the way we deliver construction. Uh, from an IPA perspective, we released our Transforming Infrastructure Performance Report and Program. That is the lightest weight of all those four documents, by the way. So if you're going to read anything, read that one. Uh, the industrial strategy at 212 pages and its precede version and the transport infrastructure efficiency strategy. These were not released in isolation. We are joining up. We are having the same discussions. We are coming around the same themes that we just spoke about. So in terms of tip, we are looking at benchmarking for better performance, alignment and integration, procurement for growth, and what we call smarter infrastructure. So what do we want for that 60 billion pound a year worth of spend, whether that's public or private, in, in, into the sector uh, via government? IPA working at that system level, we're thinking about those whole life outcomes. What are the benchmarks? How do we start to engage? From a network level perspective, have a think about some of your customers. Uh, whether that's Department for Education, Ministry of Justice. So the Ministry of Justice's policy outcome is to uh, increase re rehabilitation of prisoners, reduce reoffending rates. Obviously, the built environment plays a role in that, but actually 
we don't contract with the built environment for that outcome, but that is the outcome their policy recognizes. So when you start thinking about that customer question around how do we explain what we want as an outcome, how do we start to think about benchmarking uh, the opportunities that we have from a procurement perspective to bring people on that journey with us? And from a project and asset perspective, how does that support the network to perform as a minimum? We recently uh, released a proposal for a, a new approach to building, cannily titled, and so remembering my lesson learned of BIM, this is, this is one straight off the bat for that, a platform designed for manufacture and assembly approach. What does that mean? I'll come back to that in a minute, because we haven't quite found what the right word is. Okay? It's not modern methods of construction, it's not off-site, it's not modular, it's not any of those above things. This is about translating what we deliver into value for money and whole life performance. So how do we associate this agenda to quality of performance, ultimately? We recognize that there are significant opportunities in building on the work that has already been done, generally with, again, industry and academia, uh, in terms of the volumetric work, so people will recognize some of the modular frameworks. Uh, in terms of the component work, there was a question around NHS and, and, and health. You know, they have a repeatable rooms program. Again, we can discuss the procurement uh, aspects of these things at length, but generally there is a cultural barrier to kind of adoption uh, and the repeatability of these things. And how do we affect that change and gather people around this agenda and actually get people moving consistently in the one direction which supports the supply chain to respond and deliver with all the fantastic technology and opportunities we have available to us. So through that, um, I think you heard from Sam Stacey earlier this morning, Challenge Strategy. I'm not going to sort of dwell too long on the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. It's fair to say we're uh, investing up to 170 million in that uh, via the Industrial Strategy and the Sector Deal for construction. I am, fingers crossed, that this is not the last construction sector deal, okay? The way that works for many other sectors, so we have kind of people challenging going, okay, well, look, automotive and aerospace get billions in terms of their sector deals. We need to demonstrate track record through this program. So I'd really encourage people to engage with uh, Keith Waller and the Construction Innovation Hub, the Active Building Center, uh, Sam Stacey and UKRI to get all this technology and all these fantastic things we're doing going in a common direction. It will support us to develop the case for scaling this opportunity in the future and bringing all this tech to the market. So we must have a, have a, have a common view and a common funnel in. So we are gathering departments through a newly formed Smarter Infrastructure Working Group, which brings our digital and manufacturing agenda together, and we are focusing it in support of that agenda. What we would like is industry to respond and also funnel the other way. So we've got a clear message coming to you. This is a highly fragmented sector, 3 million people, about 900,000 different companies. That means most people are one-man band. How do you get a message consistently out there? Who should government talk to and listen to? I, I've got every tech company in the world would probably say, listen to me, I've got the solution. But actually, broadly, we need to be able to engage with the sector in an agnostic way, in a non-proprietary way, and create the market in the same way we did for BIM, by having an approach that's open, competitive, but scalable and sustainable for the sector. This is very much a kind of personal, personal thought in terms of the consumer journey. So we had a really good panel session, which was very complimentary. If anyone gets a chance to look at this TED talk, please do, and you'll start to kind of get inside the mind of kind of some of the, my, my thinking. Essentially, what we are looking at is commoditization of some of the markets so we can start to compete for service and experience. The digital technologies that are available to us today and the manufacturing approaches mean that we can start to take those sophisticated long-term steps. TIP is a 10-year vision, a 10-year program, and we have a significant opportunity as a UK to take advantage of this. But at the moment, uh, whilst we are sort of disaggregated sometimes in the way we procure and the way we think and the way we share, 
uh, and the way then the supply chain responds. We are struggling to get that level of standardization so that we're not competing on a race to the bottom on cost, but we are starting to compete on the value you can bring. And that is the big shift we're looking at through this digital manufacturing agenda. Have a look at that document. It's a good fun document. Not mine. Treasury. Having a think about kind of, you know, we have a lot of knowledge assets. If you think about Facebook and the like, their balance sheets are based on knowledge assets, intangible assets. So how do we value knowledge assets? I think it forms about 2% of our government balance sheet, essentially. How do we benchmark the productivity benefits that we can achieve through digital initiatives? How do we do that consistently so on a like-for-like -like basis we can adopt these things at scale? And when do we know the right time is to scale these technologies? If we can prove the evidence base, if we can put it from a competitive market perspective in a place where it's non-proprietary, that people are able to compete, that there is the opportunity for everyone to be involved, then government has something that it can hang itself onto and scale for you and with you. I just want to reference the Gemini principles. I don't know whether Mark Enns is speaking today at this conference or, or, uh, or anyone from the Centre for Digital Built Britain, but there was a digital framework task group established looking about the information management landscape and how we start to bring together initiatives around geospatial, BIM, smart, product data standards, etc., to bring these things together based on a set of principles that we need to be able to share information better across what we deliver so that we can plan and deliver and operate infrastructure more effectively in the future. Please go and find the Gemini principles if you haven't already. Please engage with the Digital Framework Task Group and the work of the Centre for Digital Built Britain on this agenda if you haven't. So in summary, I closed the depart cross-departmental BIM working group in March. Uh, and I'd like to say a huge thank you to uh, Fiona Moore, who's in the room, and Terry Stocks for their, uh, I think, about six years of service in, in chairing and supporting government departments to bring together all the collaboration that, that, that went on and bring together their maturity to a point that we have this significant forward pipeline, significant level of adoption. There are still some things that those departments need to go and finesse cross-department capability, knowledge exchange, so making sure we do things consistently. We heard that again in the previous session. So we're not dropping this agenda. We are absolutely committed to it. There is ever-growing pipeline demand for BIM from central government. But we've also reached well beyond the scope of our mandate. And we should, be, we should celebrate that. You know, the fantastic work that that agenda has done means that private sector adoption, major economic infrastructure adoption, which is generally private, private invested, overseas adoption. These things have all happened in the last eight years, and we are in a huge shift, but we're probably only at the end of the start. So technology will enable huge shifts in the way we operate and think but it's just an opportunity as an enabler from a client perspective to start taking a different risk position. How do we want to balance risk and opportunity in project delivery? How do we want to bring that together to form the best project delivery system in the globe? And from a public sector perspective, we are continuing to drive, support every single agenda that is out there, but what we want to do is start to bring some more consistency to that and hopefully how you respond will be with consistency as well. Thank you very much.